casket has been carried to the top of the steps of the Capitol building. It is now approaching, walking across the little veranda of the Capitol, approaching the entrance, going in through the large brass doors. We're now going to switch you to our broadcast location inside the rotunda of the Capitol. We take you now to the Capitol Rotunda and Art Schreiber. Here in the rotunda, there are hundreds of people stand silently, solemnly, as the clergyman just a few minutes ago arrived, were the first to enter the rotunda of the official cortege. Now the color guard has just walked in. Military men stand at attention as now the casket itself enters the rotunda, being borne by the military guard. They carry it slowly. Behind is the presidential flag. They're in the center of the rotunda, walking now to the catafalque, which is cloaked in drape, black drape. The bearers of the casket are now moving away from the casket towards the east quadrant. And the casket on the catafalque remains alone. Only the color guard stands to the west or the head of the bier. It is draped with the red, white, and blue of the American flag. Mrs. Kennedy has pulled back the veil from her forehead. She is dressed in black, the veil sweeping down back of her head and to the sides. She just moved it away from her forehead. of a life far from spent and in a moment it was no more and so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands there was a father with a little boy and a little girl and the joy of each in the other and in a moment it was no more. And so she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands. There was a husband who asked much and gave much. And out of the giving and the asking, war with a woman, what could not be broken in life, and in a moment it was no more. So she took a ring from her finger and placed it in his hands and kissed him and closed the lid of the coffin. A piece of each of us died at that moment. Yet in death, he gave of himself to us. He gave us of a good heart from which the laughter came. He gave us of a profound wit from which a great leadership emerged. He gave us of a kindness and a strength fused into the human courage to seek peace without fear. 
He gave us of his love that we too in turn might give. He gave that we might give of ourselves, that we might give to one another until there would be no room, no room at all for the bigotry, the hatred, the prejudice, and the arrogance which confer converged in that moment of horror to strike him down. In leaving us these gifts, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, President of the United States, leaves with us. Will we take them, Mr. President? Will we have now the sense and the responsibility and the courage to take them? I pray to God that we shall, and under God we will. That was Senate Senate. Majority Leader Mike Mansfield, who has addressed uh, a now Chief Justice Earl Warren. the hearts of all of us as the passing of a president of the United States. There is nothing that adds shock to our sadness more than the assassination of our leader, chosen as he is to embody the ideals of our people, the faith we have in our institutions, and our belief in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Such misfortunes have befallen the nation on other occasions, but never more shockingly than two days ago. We are saddened. We are stunned. We are perplexed. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a great and good president, the friend of all people of goodwill, a believer in the dignity and equality of all human beings, a fighter for justice, an apostle of peace has been snatched from our midst by the bullet of an assassin. What moved some misguided wretch to do this horrible deed may never be known to us. But we do know that such acts are commonly stimulated by forces of hatred and malevolence such as today are eating their way into the bloodstream of American life. What a price we pay for this fanaticism. It has been said that the only thing we learn from history is that we do not learn. But surely we can learn if we have the will to do so. Surely there is a lesson to be learned from this tragic event. If we really love this country, if we truly love justice and mercy, if we fervently want to make this nation better for those who are to follow us, we can at least abjure the hatred that consumes people, the false accusations that divide us and the bitterness that begets violence. Is it too much to hope that the martyrdom of our beloved president might even soften the hearts of those who would themselves recoil from assassination, but who do not shrink from spreading the venom which kindles thoughts of it in others? Our nation is bereaved. The whole world is poorer because of his loss. But we can all be better Americans because John Fitzgerald Kennedy has passed our way. Because he has been our chosen leader, 
at a time in history when his character, his vision, and his quiet courage have enabled him to chart a course for us, a safe course for us, through the shoals of treacherous seas that encompass the world. And now that he is relieved of the almost superhuman burden we imposed on him, may he rest in peace. That was Chief Justice Earl Warren. The first speaker was Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield. And now House Speaker John McCormick. This is Jacqueline Kennedy and the other <coughs> bereaved members of our beloved president, former President Truman, Reverend Clergy, and my fellow Americans. As we gather here today, bowed in grief, the heartfelt sympathy of the members of the Congress and of our people are extended to Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy and to Ambassador and Mrs. Joseph P. Kennedy and their loved ones. Their deep grief is shared, also shared, by countless of millions of persons throughout the world considered a personal tragedy, as if one had lost a loved member of his own immediate family. Any citizen of our beloved country who looks back over its history cannot fail to see that we have been blessed with God's favor beyond most other peoples. At each great crisis in our history, we have found a leader able to grasp the helm of state and guide the country through the troubles which beset it. In our earliest days, when our strength and wealth were so limited and our problems so great, Washington and Jefferson appeared to lead our people. Two generations later, when our country was torn in two by a fratricidal war, Abraham Lincoln appeared from the mass of the people as a leader able to reunite the nation. In more recent times, in the critical days of the Depression and the great war forced upon us by fascist aggression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and later Harry S. Truman appeared on the scene to reorganize the country and lead its revived citizens to victory. Finally, only recently when the Cold War was building up to the supreme crisis of a threatened nuclear war, capable of destroying everything and everybody that our predecessors had so carefully built and which a free, liberty-loving world wanted, once again, a strong and courageous man appeared ready to lead us. No country need despair so long as God in his infinite goodness continues to provide the nation with leaders able to guide it through the successive crises which seem to be the inevitable fate of any great nation. Surely no country ever faced more gigantic problems than ours in the last few years. And surely no country could have obtained a more able leader in a time of crisis. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy possessed all the qualities of greatness. He had deep faith, complete confidence, human sympathy, and broad vision which recognize the true values of freedom, equality, and brotherhood, which have always been the marks of the American political dream. He had the bravery and the sense of personal duty, which made him willing to face, face up to the great task of being president in these trying times. He had the warmth and the sense of humor, which made the burden of the task bearable for himself and for his associates, and which made all kinds of diverse peoples and races eager to be associated with him 
in his task. He had the tenacity and determination to carry each stage of his great work through to its successful conclusion. Now that our great leader has been taken from us in a cruel death, we are bound to feel shattered and helpless in the face of our loss. This is but natural, but as the first bitter pangs of our incredulous grief begins to pass, we must thank God that we were privileged, however briefly, to have had this great man for our president, for he has now taken his place among the great figures of world history. While this is an occasion of deep sorrow, it should be also one of dedication. We must have the determination to unite and carry on the 